Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nancy Wadrago with the University of Illinois Extension's Community and Economic Development Program. We're happy to have Illinois Office of Broadband and the Illinois Broadband Lab back on for this webinar in the Digital Equity Capacity Grant webinar series. Thank you very much to Ling Ling Liu, who has been coordinating these series with us and um, uh, allowing us to host uh, their wonderful content um, and assist a little bit with that. Uh, wanted to just uh, give her time today to introduce the additional presenters on the panel, and we are very grateful for this whole series and, again, for today's topic, and please take it from here. Ling Ling. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you to U of I Extension for making these webinars and recordings uh, available and possible. Uh, my name is Ling Ling Liu. I am a Community Engagement Manager with the Office of Broadband. Today, our webinar's topic is Equity in Digital Inclusion Project Implementation. This is uh, one of a series of Digital Equity Capacity Grant webinar series that the office and the lab are uh, putting forward to um, offer information to our stakeholders and potential capacity grant uh, uh, applicants to learn more about um, grant writing as well as grant implementation. I have the honor um, with me today to co-present with three wonderful community leaders um, deeply involved in digital equity work. They are Reyna with Northwest Center, Katie and Rachel, they're both with Access Living. Um, they will have a portion at the end of the presentation today to share their organization's work. A little bit more about me. I know I appear on these webinars a lot, um, so I figured I might as well put up one slide uh, to introduce myself more in depth. Um, I joined the Office of Broadband last October. Um, my background is in communication, translation, interpretation, and I also have a, a graduate level certificate in entrepreneurship. Um, in terms of uh, community work, I'm a certified medical interpreter in Mandarin Chinese probably serving the Chinese speaking population here in central Illinois. I'm also a certified diversity professional um, in equity, diversity, inclusion work. And I have over seven years experience in health, specifically in event facilitation, community health and equity, diversity, inclusion work in healthcare. Um, also prior to coming to the US, um, I worked in business development for about two years uh, in China. Uh, my passion is in immigrant advocacy and social justice, and I'm very excited to cover um, the topic of equity today with you all. So as a reminder, um, this is uh, one of the series of capacity building webinars we're presenting on, um, and we will, ha we will have two more coming up in the, on, on the Wednesdays coming up. One is more in-depth grant writing uh, webinar, and another one is to using data for storytelling. Um, please make sure that you're registered and do not miss out on these wonderful information coming up. So our object uh, objective today is to understand key concepts and terms around equity and access. Uh, also understand the unique needs of each covered population and ways to remove their access barriers and reduce disparities. And finally, learn about um, tips and strategies on equitable implementation of digital inclusion projects. Uh, so agenda today, uh, we will be giving some context on the digital equity capacity grant, and then I will go over terms and concepts around equity, um, and then followed by equity considerations and best practices for serving covered populations then um, the three partners will um, have about 16 minutes to highlight their work and their practice. And then hopefully we'll have about five to six minutes for Q&A and wrap up. So context, as you all may ha have already heard that our state digital equity plan was approved earlier this year. And we have submitted our application for our first allocation of NTIA's Digital Equity Act funding. Uh, we're hoping to hear back by end of this month, which means that um, we're expecting to release our notice of funding opportunity uh, in September. So um, watch out uh, for updated information. Uh, reminder that this grant program is one of five core activities for us to implement the state digital equity plan. Um, and this is one portion of the work that we are doing. 
And also, uh, while we're drafting the notice of funding opportunity, we are actively considering six uh, grant project types. You may have seen these in the previous co-design or input sessions that we invited stakeholders to provide input on. Um, just really quickly, um, this grant will tentatively um, cover projects like device distribution, digital literacy and skills training, digital navigation and tech support, broadband affordability program, access to expansion, feasibility study, and coalition building. Um, these are still subject to change based on our design process and our adherence to program and agency requirements. And um, uh, as you all know that uh, NTIA does require that we prioritize funding for work that uh, serves our covered populations. And there are eight covered populations as defined by the Digital Equity Act. And um, it is important to know that 72% of all Illinois residents are part of these identity groups. Um, these are ad identity groups and communities that have been disproportionately uh, impacted by digital inequities. Terms and concepts. Um, first and foremost, um, why is equity important in this work, right? Um, you've heard the term digital equity a lot from NTIA and from NDIA. Um, so this definition is the condition where individuals and communities have the information technology capacity that is needed so that they can fully participate in today's society and the economy of the United States. Um, and digital inclusion means the activities, the action that are necessary to ensure that all individuals have access to and the use of affordable information and communication technologies such as reliable broad broadband devices, digital skills training, tech support, privacy, and cybersecurity. So digital equity eventually is the outcome we're looking when we're doing broadband access and digital equity work. And digital inclusion means the activities and the action, the things that we do to achieve digital equity. Um, and it is important to note that when we use the word equity, we are acknowledging that there have been systemic barriers um, that exist that has caused in it inequities in our communities and that they must be dismantled um, before we can achieve equitable digital um, inclusion outcome for everyone. So a deeper dive into equity. Um, this is uh, a picture that I like to use a lot to distinguish uh, equality and equity. So just uh, imagine a family of four wanting to go on a bike ride, right? So equality on the top means everybody gets the same bike. As you can see, the smaller person to the far right is really struggling using that bike. For um, the second person, it's great. For the tall person, they're also struggling because they need a taller bike. And for the person using wheelchair, this bike simply is not possible for them to ride. Um, so equality is the, is the state of being equal in status, rights, and opportunities, and that we're equal with our uh, inherent worth. But equity is the idea that we provide resources that meet the individualized needs, the diverse needs of each person so that they can be successful uh, in doing whatever they want to do. Um, so at the bottom with equity, each person gets a bike that works for them. So for the person that uses a wheelchair, they now get a bike that they can pedal with their hands and arms. Uh, for the tall person, they get a bigger, taller bike. For the third person, you know, this um, bike is appropriate to their size. And for the smaller person, they get a small bike. So now the outcome is that this family may go have a bike ride in the park together. So, you know, just consider in the context of digital equity, what are the diverse needs of different covered populations, um, you know, just so they can be met in order for them to participate, participate fully in today's um, digital world. Um, this picture, uh, the one on the left, you may have seen a lot. This is uh, a sort of an older, um, outdated depiction of equality and equity. Um, I do want to highlight to the right. So the differences are the right set of pictures, the fence is not even, and um, the ground is not even either. And the number of boxes in each picture 
does not equal the same. So um, I like to think that the fence means the current barriers that folks experience, the current barriers and inequities that exist, and the ground they stand on represent the historical inequities that they've experienced. So it's the idea that not everyone is starting at the same starting point, not everyone is standing on even ground. And when we consider historical and current inequities, um, for a lot of folks, the gap is huge. And um, we must consider both of those contexts in order to serve the needs of individuals. And the whole idea of the boxes of not being equal in the two pictures is that sometimes people see equity as in, I have to take something away from another person in order to, to serve this person. That idea is false. We have a lot of resources coming down and we will continue to have a lot of resources coming down. So we're not taking things away from anyone. Instead, we are learning the needs and we're building more resources to um, meet those needs. And then if you look in the audience, um, there are a lot of empty seats. So even though the goal or the result of equity here is that every person is finally standing tall enough to view the game over the fence, there are seats in the audience. How about we just get them seats so that they can sit with premium view to watch the ball game, right? So a lot of things for us to consider here when it comes to equity. Um, feel free to share in the chat um, what differences you've noticed and how does it affect your understanding of equity. It's important to talk about disparity when we talk about um, equity. Uh, disparity is a quantity that separates a group from a reference point. And typ typically that reference point uh, is the one with the most favorable group rate. Um, a lot of the times we compare the uh, quantity, the results of uh, marginalized populations compared to white populations. Um, here um, in the middle, I have the median household income by race and ethnicity here in Sangamon County where Springfield, Illinois is located. Um, as you can see, the disparity between Black and African-American households compared to white non-Hispanic households are extremely um, significantly worse. Whereas uh, for Asian households, uh, as compared to white and non-Hispanic, um, it's significantly better. Um, so, you know, when you're looking at data where stark disparities exist, it's important to ask ourselves, how did this happen? And when we're doing digital inclusion work, um, we need to think about the data we're collecting, the information we're tracking, how is the data stratified, just so that we can track progress. Um, I also want to call out that, yes, Asian households here, the household income is extremely high. Uh, however, Asian is also an umbrella term that covers a lot of um, ethnicities. Um, it is an umbrella term that sometimes hides the disparities that exist within Asian populations. So, um, you know, again, it's important to consider that uh, just because one data point shows um, great outcomes, it doesn't mean that we need, uh, we shouldn't dig deeper to see the other disparities that might exist. And to the right, um, I have some information on Black and Hispanic adults. Um, their ownership of uh, computers, home broadband, smartphone, tablet computer, et cetera. As you can see, um, Black folks and Hispanic folks almost always have a negative disparity compared to uh, white adults in the U.S. Uh, of owning and having access to those resources. And next, um, move on to diversity. Um, diversity is all the social and biological characteristics that make each of us um, unique. Um, there are many dimensions of diversity. Um, they include gender, um, age, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, education, income, personal appearance, our values, our political and religious beliefs, etc. cetera. Um, there is so much diversity that exists among our communities. Uh, I know I like to say that Springfield doesn't have a lot of diversity, but the truth is 
there are. Um, they just haven't been really highlighted um, in the public spaces. Um, so think about the diversity that exists among your team and also among your community, the individuals that you're trying to serve. Consider what are some of the characteristics that might impact their digital access. Um, I will name one that I know a lot of the times the way a person dresses, um, you know, uh, the way they show up, they might get declined service in some spaces. So appearance is one um, characteristic that might affect someone's access. Uh, when we talk about diversity, we'll have to talk about bias. Um, so bias means the sentiment or underlying attitude or feeling in favor of or against something um, compared to another. So yes, there's positive and then there's negative bias, even though when we talk about bias, it's often negative. Um, there's explicit bias and then there's implicit. Expli explicit means it's more overt, implicit is more subtle and sometimes almost unconscious. Um, I want to get it out of the way that we all have bias. Um, you know, we shouldn't, you know, uh, we, instead of feeling ashamed uh, about it, we should focus on addressing it and doing better. Uh, we need to be very intentional about changing our biases. Um, there's this great tool called Harvard Implicit Association Test um, that you can do um, to find out if you have some implicit bias against race or gender. Um, and then um, when we talk about bias, I want to call specifically anti-Blackness out. Um, this um, anti-Blackness bias is global in nature. Um, guess what the best-selling um, skincare uh, product worldwide is? It's skin whitening products. Um, if you recall from the U.S. history, at one point in time, we used a paper bag, a lunch bag, um, to determine if someone, someone's skin is light enough to join a club to get uh, employed. So anti-Blackness um, is very um, deep in the history of the U.S. and worldwide, and that still shows up today, right? Um, and one form of bias that I want to talk about um, is um, the bias against um, poor folks uh, or folks with low income. Um, usually for folks who are low income or unhoused, um, you know, we don't trust them with cash or gift card or devices. We think they're gonna, you know, turn around and buy drugs or something or sell the device for drugs. Um, or that there's this um, myth that people are poor because they do not work hard enough. Um, I see these biases show up in the digital equity work, and I just want to call out that, um, you know, these biases are detrimental to our work serving the community and that we must uh, actively work and um, use intention to change those entities and um, biases. Because at the end of the day, if folks experience those microaggressions, they're not going to trust you and they will not come back to your organization, even though you provide wonderful services for them. So yeah, um, think about how explicit and implicit biases might affect your way of serving the community and building trust. Uh, when we talk about diversity and identities, it is important to talk, to talk about intersectionality as well. Um, it was a term coined by Professor Crenshaw. Um, it was uh, a way to discuss how systems of oppression overlap and create distinct experiences for people with multiple identity care categories. Um, it, it, it acknowledges that we must consider everything that can marginalize people such as our um, race, our gender, our social class, our sexual orientation, our phys physical ability, and that these forms of oppression can overlap. So it's important that when we're doing work, we're not just considering one dimension of diversity, we must consider all the different identifiers and diversities that exist among people and address those needs accordingly. Inclusion. Um, inclusion is the idea that we create an environment where 
each individual is able to be fully themselves and feel fully included and welcomed. Um, it is a practice or policy for providing access to resources, opportunities for folks who might otherwise be excluded or marginalized. Um, you know, when it comes to inclusion, consider how your organization is practicing um, inclusion in terms of policies and processes. Are you having diverse voices at your table? Um, does um, everyone uh, have the right or is encouraged to speak up their mind? How is the decision-making process? And when you're serving a community, are you creating programs um, that welcome and invite people of various um, identities to participate? Um, so there are seven A's of access that uh, I consider the tools to achieve equity, and um, these are the tools recommended by Dr. Jenkins. Um, so the seven A's are awareness, so inform and communicate folks effectively at their literacy level and language. Affordability, which is something we talk a lot, is to address the barriers to cost. Uh, acceptability, um, asking who what works for them, building a trusting relationship with them, and consider the distrust that exists um, historically and currently and how to better serve them. Uh, one example is that a lot of the times undocumented folks, um, you know, do not accept any form of, um, you know, government support or public aid just because uh, it's been, um, you know, stigmatizing. Uh, for them to do that, or they um, worry that inf their information might be disclosed to agencies that could put them in harm. Accessibility, um, think about the location, the transportation barriers, language access, and tools for individuals who have varying disabilities. Um, and availability, so what are your eligibility requirements, the volume, the type of your equipment and devices and services, um, what is your staff capacity and availability? Accommodation is flexibility in hours of operation. Do you offer walk-in um, options? What about phone and virtual access? Um, and then cultural and language considerations as well. Uh, accountability, um, this is a really important one that we need to build mechanisms in place to track metrics for access and equity and hold our staff accountable when their attitude and actions have caused harm to our community members. And finally, I want to call out that, um, you know, let the community guide your work. Um, there's the saying that nothing for us without us. And next up, we are going to move to equity considerations and best practices for serving covered populations. Um, here are six common um, barriers across covered populations when it comes to digital equity work. Um, they are cost of broadband, reliable, reliable internet, suitable devices, digital skills, privacy and security concerns, and finally, socioeconomic factors and injustices. There are some overarching best practices that are recommended uh, for all the covered populations, and I'll just highlight a few. Um, you know, the first one is meet folks where they are and remember that their identities and needs are complex. Um, and then when possible, look for trusted entities and persons to collaborate in your work. Um, hiring from specific covered populations so that you have a lens of the specific needs of those populations in mind. Um, and accommodation is not a burden and it should never be an afterthought. Access is a right, not a privilege. Um, tapping to the vast pool of resources and expertise within our ecosystem and um, define success and progress, knowing that it might vary depending on the region that you work in and the populations that you serve. We're gonna go in, into each of the covered populations and share some quick facts and strategies and um, I packed a lot of information in here, so I'm going to pick and choose, um, but we will share the slides for you to review um, afterwards. So for low-income households, the strategies are the same as the overarching ones because 
um, these are designed with their needs in mind. It is important to call out that four out of 10 adults with lower income in our country um, do not have broadband service. And 62% of low and lower middle income households need cost relief uh, for broadband access. So uh, great need for affordable, affordability here. Aging individuals, um, over 10% of aging individuals uh, experience poverty in our country. And oftentimes they experience economic insecurity and isolation as well. Um, so uh, it is important that we work with uh, meal delivery um, providers and other services to reach um, aging folks and build supportive partnerships and provide age-friendly digital skills programs. And our education and resources need to be accessible and provide um, you know, community-based environments for learning, such as peer groups or intergenerational groups. Uh, serving incarcerated individuals, um, a lot of them may have zero knowledge about computer or smartphone. Um, and when they are incarcerated, uh, they make very little money and there's very high cost to access uh, communication. So it is important that we build multi-layer partnerships to address those barriers, work with correctional departments, individual facilities, internet service providers, community-based organizations, et cetera, to address those needs. Um, and also um, remove cost. Serving veterans, um, average age of veterans in our country is 61 and they're twice as likely to be disabled. Um, they're more likely to live in rural areas and they're also overrepresented um, in our unhoused populations. Um, a lot of them actually use telehealth as well. So if you can consider telehealth and living in rural areas, Plus, if someone is disabled, um, that's a lot of um, overlapping inequities that they have to um, battle to get access. So we need to consider hiring veteran staff who can understand their military life, uh, understand their struggles, and also we need to address cost barrier and digital skills needs. Serving individuals with disabilities, I know Katie and Rachel will be talking about their work in this field uh, later, so I'll just quickly highlight a few points. Um, you know, we need to think about accessible spaces, train staff on technical support for using and teaching assistive technology and devices, and we need to offer assistive devices in our services as well, and work with organizations to make sure that our efforts is to um, you know, make sure they make their own choices and control their own lives. Uh, this is one example of the website design uh, of the local YMCA here in Springfield. As you can see, um, there's a text reader, um, there's a magnifier, and then um, there's also different uh, reading modes that folks can choose um, on the website. Serving individuals with language barriers, um, language barriers is such a huge um, thing. Uh, it really limit uh, people's career options, um, you know, their communication and accessing information. Uh, it's just overall difficult navigating all kinds of um, essential information such as healthcare, banking, and they also struggle with education and training. Um, these folks are usually underrepresented in data um, research and design of solutions. So some of the traditional solutions that we know may not work for them. So it is important that we build language access cost into our work, into our grant proposal, into our budget. Um, when we're using a translator and interpreter, consider folks from the community first and make sure that we compensate them equitably instead of just asking favors and make sure that unless we absolutely have to, do not use um, family members, especially underage children for language assistance. Um, and then finally, collaborate with organizations that have already established trust with um, folks with language barriers. Um, and when you're doing research or needs assessment, um, offer you know multiple language versions so that our research um, and data includes um, information from this um, underserved um, population. Serving racial and ethnic minorities, um, these are also known as Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Um, they face barriers 
um, that are really unique due to racism and the inequities. Um, they also experience huge disparities when it comes to income and wealth, um, and also access to education and employment. Um, there is absolutely a lack of trust and fear for um, BIPOC folks who are immigrants, especially if they're undocumented. Um, and historically and currently, our government investment simply has not been equitable um, in these communities. So when it comes to serving BIPOC folks, uh, we need to center racial equity. We need to review and update our policies, processes, and prioritize measurable change in the lives of BIPOC individuals. Um, and we also, again, um, partnering with trusted organizations such as places of worship, et cetera, for outreach. And serving rural residents. Um, in our country, 19 million of Americans residing in rural areas don't have broadband access. I know BEAD is pumping a lot of uh, funding into rural areas, but that might take a few years. Um, and we probably need additional funding to cover all the areas in Illinois as well. Um, they also have limited resources and service organizations as compared to urban areas. So um, when we are designing programs, think about the seasonality and agriculture demands, partner with churches and farm cooperatives, and also consider a cost of travel, especially in Southern parts of our state, um, the distance to a location meeting location um, might be very significant. And finally, I want to share one example of an organization that I work with in um, their work to deliver food and building trust um, with the immigrant community here. Um, we have a significant uh, mixed immigration status community here in Springfield. And um, during the pandemic, we found out that they, there are a lot of people who experience food insecurity. So we decided to do food delivery. Um, and these families got on our list through word of mouth, through trusted community members, because, um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, if folks are undocumented, they are uh, very hesitant to reach out to other ways of obtaining assistance. Um, in our intake, we do not ask for income information. We do not ask for their identity. We, do, we really don't ask about anything other than where they live so that we can get the food out. We, we understand that every single person is worthy of food. They're worthy of access to sustenance and nutrition. And so um, we also do not disclose their location to folks and we do not ask or share their trauma, traumatic stories. Because a lot of the times when you give people things, they feel like they have to tell you a whole story of why they deserve the help. And that can be traumatizing for folks, especially for folks who has to go through, overcome so much to get here. Um, so we usually just knock on the door, leave the food and leave. Um, our volunteers are also trusted advocates who do not put folks we serve at risk. They do not disclose their location. They don't ask their names. Um, you know, we just deliver food and move on. Um, our motto is that we walk alongside the community. We do not make decisions for them. We offer them what they need. Um, and as a result of this work, they now trust us. They call us, they email us when they need assistance with healthcare, legal support, school support, et cetera. And I have a quick slide to talk about how in the capacity grant process, our team is making sure that it's an equitable um, process. Um, first and foremost, we make sure that it's affordable. We do not require organizations to make a matching um, uh, fund uh, in order to apply, which is huge. Um, we are accessible by phone, by email. We host office hours to support our uh, grantees and potential applicants and also accountability. Um, we're very open to feedback and we incorporate your feedback in our actions. Um, and next, I want to move on to spotlight our partner of practice who can share more about tips and best practices in uh, uh, serving covered populations. Um, I will have Katie and Rachel um, to present on access living. Hello, thank you for having us. We're excited to talk to you guys about um, our program and just working with 
folks with disabilities. So my name is Katie Blank. I am the senior manager at Access Living. Um, just a little bit about me. I hold a master's degree in social work and education. Um, I've worked with people with disabilities for over 20 years in different capacities as a social worker, a therapist, or educator. Uh, I've been with Access Living for 14 years and in multiple roles, um, working as homeless prevention uh, case manager, nursing home, reintegration coordinator, supervisor for independent living um, uh, training program. And uh, I am a determination of need assessor, determining if folks uh, need and qualify for personal assistance services um, and mentorship coordinator for consumers moving out of the nursing home. Um, currently, I am the manager of the youth technology nursing home engagement and support programs, as well as our survivors of gun violence program at Access Living. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to Rachel to introduce herself. Yes, hello everyone. Um, my name is Rachel Rush and I'm the Independent Living Technology Coordinator at Access Living. Um, I joined Access Living earlier this year and my role is um, to work on the day-to-day -day, um, running of the technology program where we teach digital literacy skills through classes and one-on-one -on -one support to people with disabilities. Um, I also have a background um, in ESL where I worked on digital literacy as well, working with migrants and refugees in the Chicago area and then prior to this I was actually based in Hong Kong for 10 years where I worked on labor rights, environmental justice, public policy and other social justice issues. So I'll pass back to Katie. All right so um, Access Living is a center for independent living and we work primarily with people with disabilities, all types of disabilities, um, and we ourselves are individuals who have disabilities. We are made up of 50% um, of staff have a disability of some sort. Um, we are a local disability, consumer controlled, cross disability, non-residential, private, nonprofit. Um, as a SIL, Center for Independent Living, we believe in dignity, community, integration, civil rights, and equal access for all people with disabilities. Um, we provide services across the board um, in order to help individuals live independently and help them make their own choices as um, people in the community. Um, in regards to our technology program, um, we teach just basic computers introductory skills um, and we talk to them and teach them how to use internet skills uh, in order to help them meet a technology focused independent living goal. So they, in order to participate in our program have to identify um, needing to learn how to use the device in order to be more independent in the community. Um, so the program covers a couple different topics. We teach them about basic computer or tablet skills, such as how to turn on the device, how to type on the device, how to turn it off, how to find the internet symbol, um, just, you know, basic skills that a lot of folks don't know, um, how to use the internet, how, how to use Zoom, Word, Excel, and email. And we do try to teach that in a little more in-depth way to help them search for information that will help them be independent and help them um, utilize these devices or, or these um, uh, tools so that they can communicate with doctors, look for jobs, um, or commu communicate with family and friends. We assist with job searching skills, internet fraud and protection. Um, in our program, we provide one uh, walk-in hours and one-to-one -one support, as well as um, our six lessons that we cover with them. Um, and if a consumer qualifies for it, they can receive the device hotspot in one year of internet service. Next slide. Um, so working with people with disabilities, some things to consider and keep in mind. Um, location and accessibility of space is really important. Um, finding a, a space that is fully accessible to somebody and understanding what their needs are. So for example, even thinking about, okay, um, there's a bathroom that's accessible and the door is automatic, but is there an accessible stall in the bathroom? Or is, is it easy for the individual to get in? Is it wide enough for the wheelchair to come and go. Um, so sometimes 
spaces might say they're accessible, but if you actually go and look at it, it's not as accessible as they're saying it is. So keeping that in mind, but also um, is your location easy for an individual to get to? Are they able to take pace or public transit to get there? Or is it out of the way and not easy for them to um, get to you? So keeping that in mind, transportation limitations. So um, there are some consumers who have to use pace pair transit, and that might take a long time for them to get to you or it limits their ability to get to you. And pace isn't always reliable, doesn't always pick them up or drop them off on time. So if you have a, a meeting with them, they might come late. And if you already have another meeting planned, you're going to miss out on seeing them. So keeping that in mind and cost for an individual as well to have to pay for pace or public transit can be costly for them if they don't have a reduced fare card or a free, free ride. Um, so if you're having someone come to you to meet with them, uh, it might cost them some money that they don't necessarily have to, to, to put into it. Um, personal assistance support if needed. A personal assistant is someone who helps an individual with a disability do things they might not be able to do on their own because of their disability. So um, for example, someone who is a wheelchair user might need help transferring from their wheelchair to the toilet and back, or someone might need you to help them lift their cup if they have some water or, um, you know, essentially a, a personal assistant, if you're teaching a device, um, someone might need help um, writing information down as the lesson is going so that they can remember it because maybe they don't have the de dexterity to, to write. So um, a personal assistant can be used for multiple different things. So if a person needs that as you're working with them, please keep that in mind, as well as an ASL interpreter. Um, or braille or cart. So if someone is deaf or has a hearing disability, um, they might need uh, an interpreter present to help them understand the information being um, uh, given to them. Or if you're giving uh, paper out, someone might need uh, the information in braille as, as opposed to in writing, or they might need it in a um, audit auditory way. So you might have to um, put it into um, a spoken device and send it to them in an email um, or cart. Cart is um, trans, uh, the transcript where it's typed and then it shows up on the screen for them. Um, there are different types of disabilities. Um, there's visual and invisual. So just being aware of that and being sensitive to that. So someone might say they have a disability, but they might not look like they do. Um, but you don't know. So don't assume. You always have to ask. Ask if someone needs an accommodation. Ask how you can make something accessible to them um, because you, you don't know until you ask. Um, and everyone... Our, everyone is different, right? And so there are different learning styles that people um, have and uh, different ways that they comprehend levels of information. So also, as you're asking about the disability, ask about what is your learning style? How do you learn best? What can we do to help you understand this information that we're providing you with? Next slide. Rachel? Oh, it's this one for me. Okay. Um, okay, so I wanted to talk about some tips and recommendations for working with people with disabilities um, uh, when you're teaching them technology. Um, so the first thing I would say is ask the person what they might need concerning assistive technology. They might know, in which case, great, you can help them get set up with what it is, but you might also need to work with them to discover what they need. And so it might be a bit of trial and error, um, offer them something, see if it, if it works for them, and then fine tune it as you, as you go along together. Um, New needs might also arise when you're working with, a part, with, with, with individuals. And so be prepared to support them when you're when, uh, in meeting those needs. Um, it's good at the beginning to maybe do a needs assessment, talk to them about their own comfort levels and experience um, prior, to, to, prior to working with, with them with technology. So have they used um, a computer before and now they've um, acquired a disability and need some type of new modification, for example? Or have they never um, worked with any type of device before? And is it teaching them the very basics from, from square one? 
Um, you can also provide guidance and step-by-step -step instruction in different formats. This is really an important thing because as Katie was saying, um, different people have different learning styles. Um, so you want to be able to accommodate not just um, for a disability, but also for, so for um, different learning styles as well. So do you want to give handouts? Um, do you want to provide uh, to provide um, support in a digital format, um, display a PowerPoint, audio format, a visual format? Um, so be prepared to accommodate for this. Um, and then a very important thing is if you're working um, with assistive technology is make sure you actually know how to activate the accommodations on the device. Um, so a, a lot of um, devices today, they come with accessibility features that are already there available for you. You don't necessarily need to purchase anything new, um, but they, they do need to be set up and activated in the settings. And often um, they require um, different um, ways of operating. So you might need to teach uh, specific skills related to um, the accessibility feature that you have installed. So, so for example, on an iPad, there's an accessibility feature called VoiceOver, which helps um, assist people with uh, vision. Um, and it actually operates the, the iPad, um, but it operates the iPad through voice, through um, it, it reads to you what's happening on the screen um, so that you don't need to actually be able to, to see the screen itself. And then you use a series of gestures to, to operate the device. So it's good to learn these and know how they, how they work so that you can then assist whoever you're working with to operate their device. And then um, peer support is another very, very helpful thing that we have. So in our program, um, we have uh, consumers who have completed our program who actually come back and then help other consumers um, and encourage them and teach them um, skills on their device as well. And so just to uh, talk briefly about some of the different possible accessibility modifications. And this is by no means an exhaustive list. Um, there are lots, but these are, these are some very common ones. Um, so screen readers um, that turn text to speech, um, read out the screen um, for the person who's using it. This can be very helpful for vision or dyslexia. Um, we also, ha also have accessibility features which can turn speech to text um, to help with hearing. Um, there are uh, dictaphones, microphones, um, so somebody might operate their device by um, speaking to it or having text input to their email that way as well. Um, voice control, and vo um, where you operate your device, again, by, by using uh, speech to give commands. Um, another thing is um, using magnifiers or enlarged texts. Um, so you can actually, you can adjust the settings on the individual's device um, to, to make, make things appear much larger. You can enlarge the mouse, the cursor, all of these different things. Another thing is to think about the contrasts on the screen. Um, and I th Okay, I'm skipping ahead. Um, at contrast on the screen, it, do you want it dimmer or brighter? Um, do you want to have a color filter? Um, adjust the contrast. You might also need an alternative mouse uh, for limited hand control. So you can you could get them an ergonomical mouse or, an, or a mouse mat, which can provide more support. Modified keyboards for people who find it difficult to type um, or who need a big, bigger keys um, to make it more, more simple. Then there's also touch controls as well. If you're using a device such as a tablet, um, some of the, the hand gestures can, can be very challenging. So you can actually set up different uh, touch controls to make it uh, much more simple or, or even to, to bypass those completely depending on what, on what the individual uh, needs. Another thing, um, individual tablet cases. Um, so for example, does it need, would it be helpful to have a stand or a hand grip just to make it more accessible for the person concerned? Okay, so just, just to go over some of the success stories from our program, I think the most importantly, um, our participants have increased their independence um, by having access to a laptop or a tablet and also having internet at home. Most of the consumers that we've worked with have had limited access to a device or internet prior to program participation. And so that um, speaking to them uh, after they've taken part in the program, um, 
the majority are using their devices um, and it's really been a great benefit to them. To look at a few specific um, examples, I've had uh, participants tell me um, that they've been using it to apply for jobs online um, or for communication. So some people will use it for communicating with their doctors or even their doctor's offices to schedule an appointment. Um, communication with family and friends is very important um, so that it, it ends social isolation. It's actually one of the things um, that's really come through to me is providing consumers with the most joy is when they ha have learned to use their device so that they can communicate with families and friends. Um, we've also, um, as I mentioned earlier, some consumers have been using their digital literacy skills to then go on and help teach other people how to use it, or they've um, they've expanded their knowledge by working themselves once, we've, once they've been given the device and gone home and equipped themselves with the tools. I had somebody who's learning how to cook and is using um, apps on their on their tablet um, to look at recipes and to stay healthy and maintain their well-being. And then also another example is um, consumers who have been making travel plans, buying plane tickets, train tickets, and using their new knowledge, um, which they didn't have before. And so that that's at the end of our section, I think. So I'll pass over to the next person. Thank you. Thank you so much to Rachel and Katie for sharing your work. Uh, next, we have Raina with Northwest Center. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. My name is Raina Rodriguez with Northwest Center. We're based in Belmont, Cregan. Um, we actually cover quite a few of the covered populations. Um, so low-income households, racial and ethnic minorities, people with language barriers, specifically uh, Spanish speakers, and aging populations. Okay, so um, what are things to consider? So a lot of the things that um, I will be talking about are a lot of the things that have been mentioned prior, um, you know, especially in the introduction and the background. But some of the little things that sometimes we forget to think about or consider are really the things that are in front of your, you, you know, in front of you, in front of your face. So talking about and talking to um, the people that are already in your organization. So if you have parents involved, other participants, they really are going to be your go-to people because they want to keep being engaged and maybe will be the ones to benefit from our programming the most. So um, first, think about what they already know and what they already have access to. So for example, our questions um, really started happening during the pandemic and we started asking uh, do you have a device? Do you have internet? Um, and we did that specifically with the help of surveys and focus groups. Culturally uh, competent is super important when we're thinking about equity in the digital equity space. Um, just because technology is not necessarily, you know, a fan of everybody um, or vice versa. No, a lot of people aren't fans of technology. So kind of knowing what your population uh, thinks or has been kind of taught to think. So for example, I've come across, across a couple of people who are like, you know, technology is not a good thing. It's, it brings really bad things into our home. So kind of considering all of that stuff. Is technology welcomed in their house? Is it feared? And how can we start breaking down the barrier starting from that and just simply having a conversation? Um, inclusive language and images. So um, one thing we have come across is a lot of our participants, even in their native language, you know, in their reading or their speaking, they may be in a third or fourth grade reading level. So when we're bringing curriculum and creating that, we have to take that into consideration because they may know, you know, great Spanish, can speak it very well, when it comes to learning the vocabulary and actually reading things, then sometimes it becomes a little more difficult. So trying to really break it down and have inclusive language. If participants are seeing themselves on our flyers, on our curriculum slides, then also helps them, you know, feel a little more welcome and understand that um, they aren't the only ones going through this. Other people are as well. And really, um, I know folks that were in the session last week, we talked about coalition. So those are really important, whether you're an active member or just kind of there to listen, but make sure you reach out to other organizations that have been doing this, want to do this, you know, and have done some great job. So talk to other CBOs, um, see what they're already doing, because we don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. There's already a lot of things that we have access to that we can use. 
Next slide, please. So these are some recommendations based specifically on these populations um, that we come across in our everyday uh, programming. So low-income low households in particular, I know with ACP and Chicago Connected no longer being options, um, this is something that we can still offer them is having that conversation with them, being like, maybe there's not a free option, but there are low cost options. So whether that is having, you know, a pamphlet and ready to give them, or whether it's going to the education superhighway, you know, website and looking at what uh, plans are in their area, things like that. Encourage folks to really use the resources that are already available to them. So we always welcome them to come and use our computer lab, but you know, our hours aren't necessarily what work for everybody else. So encouraging them, showing them where their closest library is, what coffee shops are around them, um, you know, offer free internet even without a purchase. Racial and ethnic minorities, um, just I one big thing for this is they love to see themselves, you know, in what we're learning. So if we're talking about looking up a restaurant, we're going to look up a restaurant of a place they would actually want to go to. Maybe not necessarily a fast food restaurant, but a local um, restaurant that provides the food that they love to eat and stuff like that. And well, the thing that has helped us the most in this area is that the people that work here are from the community or share their stories. You know, they can say, oh yeah, I grew up the same way you did, or I also have all these siblings, or I also immigrated. And, and that's really a conversation started for our participants and it helps them encourage them um, to really know that everybody else is in the same boat. Uh, helping people with language barriers. Um, this one's a tricky one and you will have to do a lot of um, experimenting with this but just know that there are going to be some things that you just cannot find in that language you're providing instruction in. So we've had to do a lot of translating, whether that's you know pausing a YouTube every 10 seconds and adding text boxes or captions or um, screenshotting, editing, stuff like that. Um, this is something that you will have to do, you know, be ready to do, um, but in the long term, it's really worth it But because participants can see visuals and can do stuff like that. Um, aging populations, um, that's something that was talked at the beginning and even a little bit before, um, but really just make sure you're going to be have to have a lot of patience with them and be ready to teach things in more than one way. So if the way I'm teaching doesn't make sense to you, let's use a simile and analogy. Let's find a video. Let's have someone else come in and explain it. Um, and even par participants and students themselves, I always tell them, you don't know something until you can can teach it. Um, so that has been a really great strategy. Um, general recommendations, I'll leave these on up for like a couple seconds for you all to read. Um, but pretty much what I said, go out into the community, hire from the community. Um, people will be super willing to take your classes if they've met you before and know exactly where you are, what else you do. Um, have extra review time, have that computer lab open or that space open for people to come in. Um, and success story, um, we have had to do a lot of editing in our curriculum. I think we are on like version five now of curriculum we started about three years ago. So it's never too late to go back to the drawing board if there's a particular lesson or particular theme you know, topic that people just aren't understanding, uh, make sure you take that time to edit it and don't wait until the end of the cohort or something like that because you are going to leave some people confused. So just be ready. Um, and this, um, what is on the screen is just a little bit of what we had to do, our final project, we had to edit it. Um, it is kind of like a mini research project on a country and we have folks send it to the instructor um, in, in email. And so this has really allowed folks to um, be confident in sending professional emails and has led them to send emails to the teacher as, um, teachers of their kids or their doctors or even their immigration um, lawyers, you know, so it's been really great to see. And I think that's it for us. Thank you all so much for joining our webinar today and special thanks um, to our guest speakers for sharing your uh, organization's experience. I know we probably packed in two hours content into one hour and we're now over time. 
So apologies for that. Um, Nancy, handing over to you uh, for Q&A. Otherwise, I will put in our partner uh, form in the chat for you all to fill out. Thank you, Ling Ling, and a big thank you to Rachel, Raina, and Katie today uh, for your really informative examples of great digital equity programs with even the DEI approaches embedded therein. And I really appreciated also the overview from Ling Ling and just a, a lot of admiration for all of the work you all are doing. Um, I wanted to let everybody know that they can uh, put some um, questions in the chat. Uh, I'm happy to stay on um, and have this Q&A with you all. And I know there's still a lot of folks that are inclined to stay on for the next 10 minutes if there's some questions. Um, for Ling Ling, I was wondering, um, while we're waiting for any other questions, I'll just go ahead and ask one of my own. I know um, one of the things I had have been mulling over lately, you know, when you talk about inclusion work, is do you in wondering like do you think inclusion work is best done by multiple individuals and organizations that find themselves to varying degrees themselves excluded or included in whatever context in question is being looked at and so i mean what i ask that i mean like when we if we are to ask who does inclusion work, should we consider the degree to which diversity professionals or those who could be potential diversity professionals also experience inclusion already um, or exclusion? And should the included or the historically dominant group in whatever diversity context be identified and possibly given roles to advocate um, or work in inclusion practices. And I just have been mulling this over. I wanted to have a way to kind of ask that question. Uh, we see a lot of folks who get into the diversity work and inclusion work um, do so because they've had firsthand experiences. But then I wonder themselves, like, to what degree can inclusion and exclusion play a role for those who work in that? Um, and do you think that we should have, I guess, more of a like a widespread effort across many, many organizations and cultures uh, working in this area? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, the simple answer is that, yes, everybody needs to play a role in inclusion. And sometimes the act of including someone takes power and privileges, right? And each of us come with the privilege and power that we have, be it our position, our organization, being our education level, being our, you know, circle of influence in the community, et cetera. Um, you know, uh, when thinking about folks who have been traditionally or historically excluded that are now included, um, they play a very important role in, you know, advocating and including folks who are now currently still being excluded from spaces, right? And when you look up the makeup of a staff for a hospital, for example, I will use my previous employer as an example, Memorial Health, um, you know, leadership is very much 98% 98, 98 white male when healthcare workforce as a whole is very much, uh, you know, women-led female majority organization. So there is a lot of like imbalance in terms of power. And so, you know, in this situation, it's up to the women that are in leadership to bring in other women and other, um, you know, marginalized identities into the leadership fold. It is also up to the white men that are quote unquote in charge that has that influence and positional power to include people of color, other marginalized identities, um, into the advancement um, pathway. And so that, you know, our workforce, our leadership represent the diversity that exists in our communities. And we shouldn't overly burden the activities of inclusion on marginalized communities because um, oftentimes they're underprivileged, they're under-resourced, and it is almost unfair to ask them to do more, right? So the responsibility needs to be shared. And for those people who have the level of power and access and privilege 
uh, in my opinion, they need to do more. Thank you. That's such a good point. You know, adv advocacy and inclusion work are great, but leadership taking on roles, regardless of their background, can really make or break, you know, diversity and leadership as well can really make or break whether an organization is inclusive and therefore reaching their potential in general uh, because of also being inclusive. I appreciate that. I um, don't see questions, but I did have a quick question for Katie and Rachel with Access Living. Do you work with other organizations to complement their programs at times? Do you, have you ever been asked to help give tips to other organizations on how to be more accessible? And it would be great to have your um, website in the chat as well. Brilliant. I'll, I'll pop the website in the in the chat. Um, Katie's had to jump off, unfortunately. Um, and so we we um, such as PCs for people to provide the internet hotspot. Um, I'm not. Our program is relatively new. We've been running it for one year, the technology program. And I'm newer still, so I, I'm not sure about the other organizations that we might have worked with otherwise, but I can reach out to Katie and let you know about that. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's just great to see uh, sort of that digital skills education for those with disabilities, by those with disabilities, and that model, and then also wondering if there's opportunities for some cross-organizational uh, learning. Um, so, uh, but yeah, thank you for putting the website in and um, want to just give this back to Rachel, Raina, Ling Ling, see if any of you have a takeaway uh, that you'd like to share also. Maybe you have something on your mind you wish someone would ask, and then you could talk more about that. Um, any any takeaways or, or last words before we say goodbye? And you all are pretty Midwestern nice at this moment. Uh, so um, I can go ahead and just say that I think if anyone wants to contact you all, uh, we'll have your emails copied in the, the follow-up um, and folks can get in touch uh, with questions as well. I want to thank everybody for their presentations today their, and the discussion, the brief discussion we had, a uh, really important topic to, to highlight on the platform. And so I'm very grateful for you all being on. Um, want to just let folks know uh, that we'll be back next week uh, on August 14th for the next webinar in the digital equities grant digital equity grant capacity building series um, and so thank you Ling Ling and thank you to our panel and I hope everybody has a great rest of their week thank you so much bye